All right, so I imported this metadata file. And, uh, and that, what I'm doing here is, is creating a dictionary, or sorry, not a dictionary, a list, empty list. And I'm looping over from one to nine, and I simply format my input statement here to import mid one all the way through mid nine. Or, uh, and sorry, mid one through mid nine, so I'm doing I plus one. And then uh, <clears throat> that reads in a data frame. Um, and then for each of the columns in the metadata, I add a column. And those are going to be you know, individual values, same value for every file. So I can just add it like I did in the example earlier on. I pen that to the trunk, chunks, and then I do PD concat chunks. And uh, that gives me a mega file that contains the count, which is in the original each of the data sets. And then this is essentially the metadata that I've combined in here. OK? All right, moving on. Um, we're going to talk now about a little bit about reshaping uh, our data frame objects. Um, this is another uh, data set <clears throat> um, that's publicly available. It's actually in a, in a statistical textbook. Um, this is um, data on treatment for a disease called cervical dystonia. It's a physiological disorder where your neck twists to the side and you can't untwist it. It's also called spasmodic torticollis. And uh, this data includes um, information on treatments to various patients over time. So there's like three different treatments, including a, a placebo. And then it gives information about age, sex. And then the response variable is this twisters, which is a, a measure of how bad the, the disease is. Um, so the reason I've added this is that it includes uh, repeated measurements. I'm going to look at what you do when dealing with repeated measurements. Um, stack and unstack. Um, so here's, here's what the C. dystonia uh, data set looks like here. Um, stack essentially takes all of the columns, contents of all the columns, and turns them, if you don't give it any, any, uh, any arguments, into rows. Okay? So every, every row is a different measurement, but it's a hierarchical index. So this is, so this is for the corresponds to the first, all these rows correspond to the first row in the original data set. Okay. And of course, we can undo this silliness with unstack. Okay. It puts it right back where it was. Um, in this data set, uh, we might want a hierarchical index because uh, the unique identifiers are patient and observation. So every patient is observed, uh, I think, six times at w intervals of a couple of weeks. So we're going to you know, create something like that which is unique. And um, <clears throat> we might want to transform this data so that um, these repeated measurements, rather than being repeated as rows, appear as columns. And so what we want to do here is simply unstack uh, the twisters. So we're going to unstack the twisters variable according to observation. And so we get this. And we notice a few things. Not all patients. Um, made it to the end of the study. That was it's not known as right censoring going on. It's worth knowing. And um, we may want to combine this um, with the data that doesn't repeat itself. So what I'm doing here is um, I'm taking the information about that sort of patient level that doesn't repeat itself, site, ID, treatment, age, and sex. Oops. I'm dropping the duplicates, so there's a function called, or a method called drop duplicates, and then I'm going to merge it with this new twisters wide data set, and that's what I've done. So I've taken these guys and merged it with those guys. Okay. Slightly cleaner way of doing this is to um, simply set um, the patient level index uh, information as an index. So make all of this part of a multi. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven dimensional index, hierarchical index. Um, and then indexing out the twisters, unstacking it. And I get pretty much the same thing, except, of course, this is a big hierarchical index here rather than columns, depending on whether you care about that. But you can do it all in one line. Um, 
to take that wide format and convert it back to long, there's a function here called melt, which comes from the R world as well, um, that essentially takes the long and uh, you specify variables as sort of ID values. Um, and, um, and then you want to give this new variable. So it's going to make a new variable out of these guys. We're going to call it obs. And then the value name is going to be twisters. So we're going to basically just put things back the way it was. OK, just um, um, get rid of it. And it may, uh, you, you could check melt if you do this. The nice thing about using IPython here is you give it a little brace here and see if you get the same thing I do. It might, they may have just changed the, the name. Uh, if you leave that out, nothing, uh, nothing bad happens. It's just um, you just get a, a 0 or a 1. I'll call it variable. It's nothing tragic. You can rename that. Um, oh, so anytime you're uh, typing in IPython notebook and you open a paren on a, something that's a known function, you get a little summary of the arguments. Oh, okay. So, um, so wide format is where uh, the data exists in columns rather new data exists in columns rather than rows. So this is a wide format because it, in, it includes multiple measurements. If I took, if I decided to change this from a six week study to a seven week study, I'd have to add a whole column. Uh, long format is when, is this one, where if I made a seventh observation on this patient, I add a row, okay? Long is generally better because it's, you know, adding columns to things messes with the structure of data that's already there. Whereas in long format, you're simply adding rows to the same data structure, you're just adding appending rows to the same number of columns. When you manipulate columns, you really manipulate the, you know, the structure of your database in a way that you don't when you add rows, because rows are just more of the same observation. Okay? So you see the difference here? It's long because there are more rows here. And here we've collapsed it so that all of those rows are represented as one. Which is better depends on what you're doing with it. Storing it's usually better long, but sometimes when you're plotting or something, it, it can be better this way. But you do want to be able to go back and forth between them. Well, it's not just to transpose, right? Because not everything needs to be in the rows or in the columns, right? All we, all we really wanted in this case were to take all of, there's only one real outcome variable here. And all we're doing here is piling it up in as columns rather than in rows. Everything else is staying the same. So in the long format, we had repeated. Long format can be a little inefficient because, look, we're storing treatment multiple times. We're storing the same site multiple times. Best thing to do is put them in a relational database, but that's another, another topic. So there's no, so one isn't always better than the other, but I'm, I'm suggesting that it's better to store data in long format because, again, it's easier generally to add rows to things rather, because when you add columns, you mess with data that's already been collected, whereas you're adding rows, you're leaving everything else alone. Think about it for a little while. Um, did you have a question? Okay. <laughs> All right. What do we leave off? Oh, pivoting. So <clears throat> pivoting is kind of cool. Uh, it's, it's similar. Um, you've seen pivot tables and so on in, in spreadsheets probably. Um, what this does is it, it, it essentially easily um, transforms us between long and wide formats, um, at least for, for somewhat uh, simpler tables or subsets of tables. So if I call pivot, what you do is you essentially specify an index, i.e. rows. You specify columns and then the values that go in them. And so here we created essentially a, a pivot table, although there is another function called pivot table that does something slightly different, and I'll show you in a second. Um, so what if we omit the values argument? Well, uh, we get a data frame that has hierarchical columns, um, just like we did when we did on stack. So we've got um, uh, 
week one, week two, week three, all the, all the variables, since we didn't specify one that we wanted for values, it included columns for, uh, for all of them. Okay, so there's a column that contains all of the values since we didn't filter out any of them. Uh, pivot table um, allows these, um, is, is more for when you want to aggregate across values. So in this, what we're going to do here is do a pivot table where rows are site and treatment, columns are weak, and values are twisters. But then, of course, how do we combine them from all of the other columns? So it takes into account the other columns. Uh, and what we're going to do is, is we're going to specify an ag func called max. So we're just take the maximum twisters value. And so we, this is a really nice way of you know, summarizing uh, relatively complex data, because now we can see what the highest value, you know, in other words, the worst state of disease is um, among each of the treatments by site in a nice tabular format. Uh, if you just want frequencies, i.e. counts of how often things occur, um, cross-tab will do that. So we just want to cross-tabulate the counts of observations, uh, sex by site. It was good, you know, just kind of metadata. How many, how many women and men did we get at each site? Is there a bias there somewhere you might want to look at? Okay. Um, <clears throat> some transformations of interest. Uh, I think I showed you this a little bit earlier. Uh, we can see which vessels are duplicated and remove them. We did this earlier on. So I'm removing duplicates uh, of the same name. Okay. So rather than 10,771 ships or segments, I now have 10,253. Okay. Uh, we can replace, uh, replace values. So if we have um, values that are encoded as strings that we actually want to use in a quantitative analysis, uh, we may have to encode those as quantitative values. So um, looking at the uh, cervical dystonia, uh, data set. Um, we've got uh, the value counts by treatment, um, and uh, we may want to turn these into numerical values, these labels. And so uh, we can come up with a, a map that maps um, each of these names to a value, and then uh, simply do a map on treatment, and, and in replaces um, those labels with integers now. Or we simply, uh, we may want to replace a particular value. For example, uh, in this series, say we want to take the logarithm of all of these values, but if you take the logarithm of zero, it's negative infinity. So, you know, we, maybe we can just replace that zero with a really tiny number and take the log, you know. I didn't have to do that. I could have just added that to the whole series. But you get the idea. If you just, for whatever reason, want to replace a value, you can, you can do that with replace. It takes the original value and then the, the new value. Okay. And again, using the same map that we used before. Uh, indicator variables are, are useful for statistical analyses. Um, so this is where um, you're essentially identify, you've got a categorical variable, um, and, uh, and you want to break that out into multiple columns, showing whether or not each observation contained that level of the variable. And you do that by creating indices. So um, what I'm doing here is I'm taking um, uh, all of the vessels and looking at the, uh, you know, the top five vessel types. And um, what I'm going to do is create dummy variables for each of those five types. So it was like cargo, pleasure, I uh, can't remember all the other, tanker and all of those other things. And um, I can create, uh, using the get dummies uh, function, this set of indicator variables. So the, the first, this ship was a tugboat, this ship was a pleasure boat, et cetera. Okay, and these are useful in statistical analyses for things like analyses of variance and so on, where you identi identifies groups. So are you in this group, are you in that group? Um, discretization, um, sometimes we have uh, continuous variables that we think we want to uh, discretize. It's sort of bad statistical practice to do this, discretizing continuous variables, but um, 
Um, you may want to do it for various reasons. So for example, uh, the age in one of our data sets. Um, it's very easy in pandas to chop those up into uh, bins. And uh, what we can do here is, uh, for example, split the ages up into decades. And so we use the function cut, we pass the age variable, and then the cut points that we want to use. So 20, 30, all the way up to 90. And, um, and we get something odd looking uh, like this. And what this is, is essentially is, is it's turning a continuous variable into a categorical variable. And uh, um, so each of these become categories. So this first um, observation is somebody that was between the ages of 60 and 70. Okay, they're just categories now. And uh, the, the, the parenthesis indicates a, um, an open interval. So it doesn't include 60. And then the square bracketing is a closed interval. So there can be 70 year olds in there, but not 60 year olds. So 60 year old would be in the pre in the lower section. It shows you the index down here, what they look like. And notice these are all object categories. Okay. Um, you can reverse that. You do right equals false. And you notice now the parens are, are uh, switched around. Now, now the closed intervals on the left hand side. So now we have uh, ordinal rather than numeric values, so we can give them labels, which can be useful, right? Uh, at least for plotting and things like that. Mean, more meaningful, more, e labels that are easier to look at. Um, we can also cu cut by uh, quantiles using Qcut. So uh, if you just give it an integer value, it'll break it into um, equally spaced intervals by default. So if I take age, I want four age classes, one, two, three, four age classes. Okay, obviously the youngest person was 26, the oldest was, was 83. Or we can specify custom quantiles to pass. Okay. So we got the 95th and 5th quantile, the first, you know, the, the extremes in this case. And we can, uh, you know, Perhaps we want to do something like that, combining our quantiles with dummy variables so we can see which group each of these individuals uh, fall into. Um, for uh, some data analyses, um, we want to do things that are, have been randomized or reordered. Um, for example, drawing random elements from your data. and. Um, one way of doing this is to use the uh, permutation function in NumPy in um, association with the take method in uh, data frames. And so what we want to do here is say we want to simply reorder the data. Okay, we want to uh, randomly reorder the data. We want to include all of it, but randomly reorder it. So what we do is uh, NP ran NumPy's uh, random.permutation function uh, takes a random ordering of integers uh, of a particular length. So this is taking uh, a, a, um, all the integers between zero and the length of however many segments there are and reordering them, okay? And so we, we're, all we have to do now is um, use take to get the reordered data frame, okay? So it no longer starts with MMSI1. It starts with the one that was indexed out by that number. If you compare that, compare that to the original. Okay. Um, this is incidentally a way of um, doing what's called sampling without replacement. So if I um, if I um, simply took the first five of these, that's what it gave me before. So the first three of these. Um, that's a random sample from that data set, but without replacement. It can only occur uh, once each, because we've got, we've got a, a unique set of integers that we've just switched the orders around. You can't take more than one of the same one. Um, if we wanted, this is another hands-on, we're running, we're down to like our last half hour here, so um, um, uh, hands-on exercise will be, how, how would you do, if you want, uh, random sample with replacement. How would you how would you go on go ahead and do that? Oh, I don't know. Good. Well, we can go ahead and do this one then. Um, 
Um, yeah, how would, how would we do this? Anybody have any ideas? Rather than t this is a fast one, so rather than take a break. <clears throat> well, in NumPy, there is a... Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So in, inside of MP random, um, there is random integers and int. I think we can go. Okay, so low and high to size. So we can go 0 to 100, or let's go 0 to 10 of size 100. And now we get random sequence, but with replication. And we use that with take, we can index out the values that we need. Okay. All right. I thought the time had gone by pretty quickly. Pardon me? Yeah, so it's, 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 um, it's removing, um, it's removing the, the ones corresponding to the requested indices from one axis or another. You can do it in other ways, certainly. You can index out the values directly. Yeah. Not in place. It's not, it's not. Yeah, you can you can select them. You can use a selection method as well. There's more than one way of doing this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. Uh, you got to be careful what axis that you're drawing them from. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, really uh, powerful features of pandas is its uh, aggregation functionality, and um, there's a, a number of instances in which we're interested in this um, aggregation where we want to, you know, compute sums of means within groups or among groups, um, slicing the data frame and, and doing something with those slices, or some sort of transformation that you want to do on a group-by-group group, uh, basis, like standardizing or normalizing uh, data. And um, um, so what we do is, for example, if we want to do something with our uh, dystonia data set by, by patient, we're going to call C dystonia group by and then give it the patient series. And this group data set, it, you know, it's hard to visualize because what, what you get back is this data frame group by pandas object. Um, but this is sort of an, just an intermediate step. Um, and, and what we can do is, is iterate over those. So we could take this C dystonia group, and if we simply just wanted to see what was in it, we would get, because it's grouped by patient, it's essentially an iterable with patient as a key, and then the data corresponding to that in, in each. So it breaks it down essentially into, into chunks. So this sort of general approach to analysis is, is informally known as split, apply, apply combine, where we take a, a, data, a one large data set, split it according to a key, so here it's ABC, apply some variable to it, like a sum, and then we recombine it. So it's, you know, it's Hadoop, right? It's the sort of thing Hadoop does. Um, and, uh, and we can do that in pandas using this aggregate function, or we've got a short version called ag. So if we want to take that grouped data set by patient, um, and aggregate it by mean. It gives you the mean value of uh, everything in that data set except for the things that are obviously non-numeric. Okay. Um, some of these are you know, so heavily used that there are uh, convenience methods. So rather than ag mean, you can just do mean on a group by object. And, um, and we can uh, add suffixes to the uh, columns that get generated as a result that are more meaningful than their original variable names if we need to. Okay. 
Uh, here's a, a way of generating the median, so it's the, the same as the uh, 50th quantile, right? That's the median value. Um, we can aggregate uh, along more than one key if we wish. So this is week by site, so now we've got this hierarchical index, and now we have the means of all sites over all weeks. Or uh, as we, I suggested before, we could transform the data. Uh, when we're doing regression analysis, we often want to uh, normalize uh, the input variables, so we subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation, so it makes it a mean zero uh, variable with a standard deviation of one. And then we uh, simply use the transform method to apply that across all of them. And, and of course, for some we get, um, well, not of course, but we get, in this case, we get some um, NANs, probably because the standard deviation for these are, are bad when they're the same number. Okay. Um, we can do column selection within these, so we take the, the grouped data and we extract just our variable of interest, the twisters variable, and we do the mean of that. Okay. If we want it, again, as a data frame, we have to include two sets of brackets, otherwise we get a series. Um, or it might be something as simple as dividing your data frame into chunks and doing, you know, doing something with those chunks. So um, if we take that group data set and we cast it as a list and then to a dict, we get um, a dict with the keys being the patients, essentially. So this is patient four's uh, information. And of course, this grouping can be done uh, by column instead of rows if we want, okay? Except now, of course, we're gonna, we're gonna have a lot more, uh, or a lot more column. Oh, sorry, here's what we did here. We, we've grouped by um, the type, data type. So this is a good way of separating out numerical variables from non-numeric variables. And doing this long axis equals one means that we're gonna do it by columns, which is what we want. So now we've got a dict with the first one being the int 64s and then the second one being object for the object columns. Okay. And if we've got uh, multiple indices, so if we go back to this one with a hierarchical index, um, we could do a group by, specify a particular level, so just the observations, leaving patients as is on axis zero and taking the mean of that. Okay. So we can pick out whichever level of a hierarchical index that we want. Uh, this can all be generalized with the, uh, the apply um, function, or method, I should say. Should be a method there. Um, so what this does is it takes uh, a data, fr data frame and a column name, uh, sorts uh, this one here, this function here, is a function for uh, taking an index by column sorting it in ascending value and then taking the first n of them. So it's taking the top however many of each of, of the column that we specify. And so we can apply this to, um, to our, our vessels data. So let's say we want to take um, the, the uh, longest three segments for every ship in our database. So what we do here is we take our segments, our merged segments data set, we group by MMSI, and then we apply um, uh, this uh, top function that we've just specified here by segment length. And it takes a while, large data set. And uh, let's just look at the first few here. So our first ship, those are the th three longest segments, second ship, three longest segments, et cetera. Split a, black, split a plaque by. Um, here's an interesting one. So if we remember that um, microbiome data set contained uh, the taxon name all the way down to genus, and it had this big long um, list of taxonomic um, 
labels. What if we only wanted it down to, say, class or family, except rather than all the way down to genus? How would we do that? How can we break up our data set, split them up, and then combine them uh, by some higher level of organization? So here's what our index looks like. And we notice that each uh, taxon label is separated by uh, a space. So what we can do is, is use the, the string method split and join, right? So what we do is we come up with a little function that uh, splits each of those elements by a single white space. Um, and let's say we would just want class, and class is the third one, right? It goes something like kingdom, phylum, class. So we're just going to take the first three. It's going to take the first three of those, and then it's going to rejoin them with a space again, OK? And um, give pass that to map, and we've got a new, a new class index. Okay, so we've re-indexed it. We've replaced the old index that is unique uh, with one that isn't. Okay, so now we've got, you know, these used to have multiple genera. Uh, now they're the same class. And so the way that we would re-establish this unique index is uh, doing a group by and a sum, right? So we're going to group by this level and uh, sum it up. Okay, and now we get uh, uniquely identified some uh, counts of classes. So we've combined rows and given them new labels. Okay, so that's kind of useful. All right. Um, so uh, for the next exercise, and we're going to use this uh, data set a little bit particularly in the next section. Uh, there's a, a data set called titanic.xls, and it's a, uh, a data set on the um, passengers on the Titanic. And there's a uh, HTML file in there that explains what the, what the variables are. Um, so it includes things like, well, the name of the person, uh, which passenger class they were in, whether they survived or not, age, sex, where, how many siblings and parents were on, board, um, how much they paid for their ticket, where they're from, et cetera. So uh, our analysis here is, um, does the whole women and children first thing really apply? Is, is it a, a truism? So we're going to analyze the data for um, survival by sex, by class and sex, and say by a couple of age categories. Um, so let's combine this with a, another short break. Maybe at least do the first, try to do the first one. Um, uh, see if you can do that group by and see if you can calculate the proportion of passengers by sex that survived using the split apply combine. So it's uh, 345 right now. Let's reconvene in, at uh, 355.